Erev Tov, Chavrin. I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching Israeli News Live. Here it is today, February the 16th, 2018. And a very provocative message this evening. Is there no king in thee? Now, this is a very in-depth investigative report, friends, that we have worked on here for quite some time. And some of the details are going to be very troubling. And I want to assure the listeners here of our love and support of Israel, our love for the Jewish people, and our, our just our deepest support for the nation of Israel. But yet at the same time, some of the information we're going to speak about tonight is going to uncover a very sinister plot that has been happening in the state of Israel since 1948 until modern times here. And it's going to be something that not many people can deal with. Not many people will really, maybe they don't even want to hear it. Maybe people want, that have itching ears would rather not hear the things we're going to say. And at the same time, I need to make sure that I warn you and let you know that there are channels that have been specifically created to come against Israeli News Live because of the fact the information we keep uncovering of Vatican's plot to take over Jerusalem and divide the land for gain, that is something that there are those out there right now posing to be believers that come against what we're doing here. It's a very troubling time we live in here, and the thing is, is we're not here to be uh, a biased news broadcast or a biased researchers here. We're here to tell you what is really true, what is really going on. And if you really have the heart to know truth, to know biblical prophecy, the way it truly unfolds in this modern day that we're living in here, and to examine the facts, then stand with us. Because we do need your support in doing so. In fact, it's your support that has kept us going this entire time. But I wanted to caution you and let you know there are channels that have been created for the specific purpose to undermine the work we're doing here because we're definitely hitting a nerve. Tonight is going to be one of those nerves. So I want to get right into the broadcast. Is there no king in thee? Of course, this is taken from the prophecy of Micah chapter 4. <clears throat> Now why dost thou cry out aloud? Is there no king in thee? Is thy counselor perished, that pains have taken hold of thee as a woman in travail? You know, and you have to remember, this is taken from Micah's prophecy in chapter 4, where just a few verses above this, around verse 6, 7, and 8 there, God is talking about bringing back the remnant of, uh, of Israel home again. The house of Judah, according to Zechariah's prophecy that says that, that the house of Judah would be returned first before the house of Israel so they don't lift their foot up against the other. And we see in modern days that God has truly returned the Jewish people, as he says in the prophecy, those that were halt and lame and withered. In fact, I'll read a little bit to you about this. And friends, bear with me. This is a lengthy message. This is nothing that is going to be simple or easy, what I'm about to share with you. This, these are, you're going to hear things tonight that you have never heard before. And so I ask you to please bear with me and stay with me on this here. But as we read here, in that day, saith the Lord, verse 6, will I assemble her that is halted, and I will gather her that is driven out, and her that I have afflicted, the house of Judah. And I will make her that, that is halted a remnant, and her that was a cast afar off a strong nation, and the Lord shall reign over them in Mount Zion from henceforth even forevermore. Then he says the very next verse, verse 8, and thou, O tower of the flock, Migdal Eder in Hebrew. All right? The stronghold of the daughter of Zion. There shall it come even the first dominion. The kingdom shall come to the daughter of Jerusalem. Now why dost thou cry aloud? Is there no king in thee? Has thy counselor perished? Well, you know, the odd thing is, I have been speaking on this for years. And the very first time that God ever revealed to me, and at the time I, I didn't even know the scripture of Micah, was in 1996 when Prime Minister Netanyahu was elected to the, as Prime Minister of Israel. 
Now we know he served in, in, in different factions in the Israeli government. He was also he was the uh, uh, he was the uh, United Nations representative for Israel. Uh, several other places there he served in the government. But when he was elected in 1996, I went over to Destin, Florida, and of course as he got elected, the, we we had the Jewish people. They were uh, screaming and shouting in the streets with jubilation, saying, "BB King of the Jews." Bibi, king of the Jews. And that became so popular, everyone was calling him king of the Jews. As you can see, Time Magazine, King Bibi. You know, the funny thing is, of course, Bibi is uh, Prime Minister's nickname for Benjamin, as is, is, is they call him Bibi. But the odd thing is about all of this, I don't know of any other Prime Minister of Israel that has ever been called the king of the Jews. And I'm going to get into a very interesting story about this because in just a little bit here, Mike Evans, who tells the story of anointing him to be and prophesying over him that he would be prime minister over Israel, not once but twice. We're going to go to that in just a moment here. And I used to love this story. I've told it many, many times, even here on Israeli News Live over the years. I've shared that uh, incredible story that Mike Evans did. But my investigative report has some very disturbing twist tonight that's not for the faint of heart. As I go back into this, so I want to share with you what happened in 1996 after the Prime Minister was elected. I was in Destin, Florida, and I was at a hotel there. I was doing a delivery, actually, at the time. And as I got into an elevator, there were some children there that were speaking in the Hebrew language. I understood them, and of course, I spoke to them back in Hebrew, asked if their parents were there. They said yes. They went, went up. Their father was asleep, but their mother came down. We sat down in a public area there, uh, and she came down, and we spoke uh, extensively. A very nice lady. She was an airline stewardess, and her entire family was with her there in Florida on a vacation. And I asked her, not even knowing what was about to happen, but suddenly I felt an anointing come upon me. And I said to this lady, I said, isn't it interesting how that we just elected Prime Minister Netanyahu and how the people have ran through the streets crying, Bibi, King of the Jews, Bibi, King of the Jews. And she smiled with a great big smile and she said, yes, she says, isn't that wonderful? I said, it's wonderful. I said, but it will never work. I had no idea why I even said that. But it began to flow from my heart as I began to speak to her. And she said to me, what do you mean it, would never, it will never work? He had just been elected. I said, you see, my sister, you have to understand. As a Jewish people, as an Israelite nation, not just the Jews, but as an Israelite nation, the way we leave God is the way we must return home. When our people were still one nation, and Samuel the prophet, God was using to lead the people, as he did with Moses, as the mantle went from Moses to Joshua Benun, as it went from down from through the prophets, and now Samuel. And Samuel was a judge in the city, right there, right next to Jerusalem there. And you can go there to this day. There is a city there with a stone there with his name on it. All right? And Samuel had been leading the children of Israel. And I said to her, but our people began to get restless and we wanted to be like the rest of the world. We wanted a king to go out for us. But it wasn't God's way. And finally, God says to the prophet Samuel, they did not reject you, but they have rejected me from leading them. And tell them, I will give them a king, but tell them what will happen when they get a king. He will take your daughters. He will take your sons. His sons will run before the king in his chariots. Your daughters will become the cooks for him. And all the things that would happen. And I said, this is where we sinned as a people and as a nation, going out from under the hand of Almighty God. I said, the first king we got was Saul. He could never keep the word of God. I said, then we got David. He was a good king. 
As the Bible said, he was a man after a God's own heart, but it still was not God's perfect will. Then we had Solomon, his son, and he started off well. I said, but then he went off into sin and married in wives that brought in idolatry into Israel. I said, and finally we ended up with an Ahab. And Ahab caused the dispersion of the house of Israel and brought Jezebel into the land that brought idolatry, paganism into Israel. I said, and then finally in 70 AD, as the sins began to plummet in the land, I said, our temple was destroyed. Now, I did not feel at the moment to talk to her about Yeshua, but I felt to tell her that's this part here. And it was not me. I could really feel something was moving in me. And I said to her, and then 70 AD comes along. I said, even with the Maccabees, I'll, I'll share some things with you myself, just with me and you. The Maccabee brothers, they come in. They started off good, seemingly to do the right thing. They wanted to restore the temple. They wanted to bring things back, but then they usurped the, the authority of the king. They put a man in there that was not in David's lineage. They usurped the priesthood, the, Zadok, the Zadokite priesthood that was through Aaron's sons. They put in a man that was not a true man of God to actually lead the spiritualness of the nation of Israel. And before you know it, later down the road, their sons made a covenant with Rome, brought Rome in. I said, and then what happened when Rome came in? We became under that Roman persecution till finally our temple was destroyed. Titus comes in. His father first began that assault. At the beginning, I said, you know, we win the wars and we defeat the Romans, we defeat the Syrians. I said, but at last, Titus' father leads a campaign. He comes back in and he begins to destroy our people, starting up in the Galilee, coming all the way down, down around Masada, coming back up to hit Jerusalem. I said, and then what happens? Of course, Nero dies and he has to go back to Rome, but his son comes down, Titus. A much wiser man. His father knew he could trust him. And then he went and got all the people that hated the Jews. Because the house of Israel was already gone. Ahab made sure of that because of his own breaking of the covenant that he broke that was made between Jacob and Laban. He broke that covenant between Jacob and Laban. Because remember, Laban said, if you take any other daughters than those that which are my daughters, God be, God be judged between... You and me. And Ahab broke that covenant. He married Jezebel. A Zidonian. Do you know the Zidonians were part of the Nephilim? You want to talk about bringing back idolatry. Not only idolatry, we're talking about the Raphaim, the fallen part of the fallen, the Nephilim part of the fallen ones. That's what the Zidonians were. They had inbred amongst the Raphaim. Very serious situation. Maybe you ought to look up Barry Chamish and what he says about the Nephilim in Israel today. Interesting stories there. But at any rate, as I shared with her, then the temple was destroyed. And our people were dispersed to all the world. I said, what's interesting though, as I said, God did promise through his prophets, Zechariah, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, you know, Micah, Daniel, we would return again. I said, and our people have returned home. In 1858, our people began to come back in because the Ottoman Empire changed their laws and allowed the Jewish people that were living in the Middle East to buy purchased land inside of Israel the way Abraham, our forefather, did. Notice the parallel. Abraham never came and killed the occupants for the land. He purchased the land. Like the cave where, where his wife was buried. He purchased this land. 
And the Jews in the beginning under the Ottoman Empire came back. They began to purchase the land like their father Abraham did. Now when Moses bring, comes back and Joshua brings the children over, they have to defeat the inhabitants. Why? Because the land is full of the Nephilim. 1858, though, we were already becoming a nation. 1948 was not really the birth of Israel. But you know, Rome knew that they could not stop the Jews from coming in. When the Ottoman Empire did what they did and were allowing the Jews to come in, Rome would not sit back and allow the Ottoman Empire to allow a Jewish nation to be born the true way that God was opening the door for our people. And we would have later, later gotten autonomy and fulfilled the prophecy according to the way God would like it to be. Many of the people, even some of those that have risen to power in modern days, are parts of those families that came under the Ottoman Empire. But Rome got, they made up with, with Britain, and what did they do? They took, and the Romans had the, the British and the French go and topple the Ottoman Empire, according to prophecy of Daniel 11, around verses 38 and 39. Made that allegiance there. And of course, what do they do? They begin to divide up the land. So in 1948, they could take the land. I said, now we begin to come back. And I said to the sister, I said, notice. I said, we're, we're coming back home from the Holocaust, the ashes of the Holocaust. As Micah prophesied, the, 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 the halt and the withered would return home. I said, and we begin to return home. I said, now the thing is, we have to have a king as well. I said, because the way we left God is the way we must return to God. And she was listening so intently. I said, yes, we've had prime ministers. I said, but Israel must have a king. And then the king must fail. And I told her that day, I said, I said he will never work as a prime minister. I said, you will see it as the time goes by. I said, something will happen I said, and I even, then I told her, no doubt he is a good man. And I see that he stands for good things for the Jewish people. I said, but regardless of how good he may appear to look and to be, it will never work. I said, because the way we left God is the way we must return to God. I said, and of course, as the destruction came and we were dispersed throughout the, all the world, now we've been gathering back in. At first, a little tiny remnant began to come in. And then more came in. And now we have the king, as it was in the days of the, the kings of Israel. And finally to David and Solomon, etc., I said, and as these kings, once we come to the place when we begin to realize that our king will not save us, and you have to remember, I, didn't even, I wasn't even thinking of the scripture of Micah at that time. I said, when we begin to recognize that our king cannot deliver us from the hands of our enemies, I said, then we will cry out for Elijah the prophet. I said, do we not, as a Jewish people, every Passover... Do we not open the door? We set the table for the Seder. We place a cup of wine at the end of the table for Eliyahu Hanavi, Elijah the prophet. I said, why do we set the table and leave the door open and expecting the coming of Eliyahu, Elijah? I said, because we know according to Malachi's prophecy that according to Malachi, Elijah will come before the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Now, I knew already that part of that prophecy applied to John the Baptist as we begin in chapter 3, that he'll make straight the paths of the Lord, etc. And I know that, and I knew as well, I didn't say it to her, but I knew as well that Jesus had prophesied about Elijah and he spoke about John the Baptist. And he says in one place that he was the one that turned the hearts of the fathers to the children. But if you notice, Jesus never applied the part of turning the children's hearts to their fathers. Only part of it. 
You got to watch what Jesus says. Be real careful and watch what he says. And I didn't discuss the part about where Jesus says when they ask him after Mount Transfiguration experience and they said, I thought the, scri the scribe said and Pharisee said that Elias must first come. And he said, truly he shall first come, shall first come and restore all things. I didn't tell her about those, but I said, we leave the door open. And I was sharing this with someone the other day, that story. And while I was sharing it, suddenly the Holy Spirit come upon me again. And the Lord revealed to me, why do they leave the door open? Why is there a cup laying there for them? It's because when Christ left, he was rejected at the communion table. And that glass of wine, and of course they have tried to find that charger all the way down through the years. And that glass of wine has been setting there for the coming of the Mashiach. It's not even really for Elijah. It also represents the cup that Joseph put inside of Benjamin's bag, the innocent brother that had nothing to do with his death. Just like the Jews today, they weren't there 2,000 years ago, but yet that door is open, that cup is there to say, Joseph, here is your cup. We've returned it to you. So prophetic. Unbelievably prophetic. And when I said to her, we leave the door open, do we not leave the door open for Elijah? And something was moving within her and she said, you are so right. I never thought about it like that. I said, so he will never work as a king. I said, he'll be a good prime minister, no doubt. And he will try very hard. I said, but he will fail. I never thought of my words being prophetic. And I don't say that they are, but I, sometimes I can't help but wonder if they're not. Because truly, Micah said, is there no king in thee? Because God knows we have to have a king that will fail. Now, as I said, Prime Minister Netanyahu was elected prime minister. They run through the street, streets screaming, King, Benny, King of the Jews. They were even calling him King of the Jews, BB King of the Jews, before he ever got elected. And in 2015, when he was elected the second, second time, again, King Bibi has won. Now, I want to share some things with you. As I begin to put this together in my investigative report, this is on uh, Jewish Israel, their website. It's entitled Seven Days of Destiny. And of course, the article, as you can see here, is Mike Evans here. It says, more than 30 years ago on my trip to Israel, God worked an incredible series of miracles, one after another, that shaped the course of my life and ministry. And on the second of those seven days of destiny, God miraculously opened the door for me to meet with Prime Minister Begin. And that's, of course, Mike Evans and Prime Minister Begin. I first heard this. I, I think someone sent me a, a DVD of Mike Evans years ago uh, when I first started the ministry. And I heard about this story and I listened to it. And my heart was really touched as I listened to this story. And I have told the story many times. And I want to share the story, what Mike Evans actually says. I almost have it memorized. And, and not verbatim, but almost memorized. I'm going to share with you what Mike Evans actually spoke about on that story there. And I've always held it dear to my heart. But recently, I discovered some very shocking facts that may give a little bit different light on this story. According to Mike Evans, when he goes to Israel, he was also a journalist, but he was a, he was a believer in Jesus. He was a messianic Jew, you might say. He was a believer in Yeshua, according to his own testimony. And he goes to Israel. He says he doesn't know why he was going, but he wanted to meet with uh, Prime Minister Begin. Menachem Begin was his name, of course, the prime minister at the time. And we're going to be going into every single prime minister tonight as well briefly on them. But anyway, he met with Prime Minister Menachem Begin. When he gets the interview at the office, the Prime Minister asks him, what are you here for? He says, honestly, he says, I do not know why. And it really, after they were talking a little bit, and he asked the question, and he says, you wanted a meeting with me. He says, why did you want a meeting? He says, I, I don't know. And it seems also very sincere and very honest. And I really have always, and I still want to say, I want to believe the story. But there's just some things that seem awkward. 
But I believe that Mike is a good man. He's done a lot of good things for the Jewish people in Israel. And I have to say that. He has. He helps the, the homeless, the, the hungry, and the Holocaust survivors. He's done many good things for the Jews in Israel. All right? So I don't want to take away from Mike Evans when I say this. But I want to share some very troubling things, though. Anyway, in the story, as he says here, he goes back to his hotel. Later that night, Mike gives the story that uh, there was an article comes out in the paper the next day. It was the death um, of Jonathan Netanyahu. That was Prime Minister, excuse me, current, the current Prime Minister of Israel, Benjamin Netanyahu, his brother. He'd been killed in trying to rescue the hostages there. He was a commando. In fact, Prime Minister Netanyahu used to be a commander back in 1967. I forget what year he finished, like about eight years or so. I think he served as a commando also in the Israeli uh, armed forces there. But his brother was killed. He says that he read this in the paper. He goes and he gets a cab driver and he says, uh, do you, he says, do you happen to know? He says, because the Lord places on his heart, go and comfort the Netanyahu family. And he says, he gets a cab driver and he says, do you happen to know the Netanyahu's? Of course, he tells the story. He says, yes, he does. Goes to his house, knocks on the door. And the father of Prime Minister Netanyahu opens the door. He introduces himself. He allows him to come in. He says, and when Benjamin Netanyahu come out of the room, he tells the story that he felt moved by God. He grabbed the cruise of oil off of the, the mantle and he anoints Benjamin over the head and says that he prophesied that he would be prime minister of Israel not once but twice. Now, maybe it truly was of God or maybe it was something they knew they were planning to do. I can't really say for sure. But I would like to believe the first. But let me share with you the facts, okay? When he anointed him, and of course, when I heard the story, I knew immediately, as a Jewish believer myself, a member of the Chabad community as well, that when you anoint a man to be a leader of Israel, you are indeed making him a king. And this is why even before Prime Minister Netanyahu became a Prime Minister in 1996, they were calling him King Bibi. They were already spreading this all through the people, that he was King of Israel. And as again, as I said, as good of a Prime Minister as he was, or, and that he would try to be, it would never work. And I appreciate Prime Minister Netanyahu, so don't get me wrong in what I'm saying here. I just want you to follow. As I said, it's a very disturbing news I'm going to share with you. So he anoints him as the prime minister of Israel, I mean, to be prime minister, and he prophesies he'll be prime minister twice. Now, you have to know a little bit about Prime Minister Netanyahu. Before he became prime minister, when he was living in the United States, after he'd gotten his education, he'd gotten a job making a huge salary in the United States. He forfeits his, that job, and he goes back to Israel, working, I believe, in a furniture store or something like that, making only like eight, nine dollars an hour. He goes from thousands of dollars annually, I don't know if it's six-digit income or really high, like 100000 a year or something like that, I forget the exact figures, but he forfeits that, goes to Israel to work only to make a very small wage. And a lot of people have always noted, that was kind of odd that that happened. Well, he gets anointed and he goes back to Prime Minister Begin and he says, I know now why I came. And Prime Minister Begin said, okay, I want to know. He said, the Lord has told me to come with, to meet with you that we want, I want to help to work to build bridges. He said, okay, you want to build bridges. Let's build bridges then. And he tells him about what happened with Prime Minister Netanyahu. And he asked him, can you give him a job in your administration? And he does. But that's where it gets interesting. Now, I saw this just recently. And I'm sure it's been out for a little while because it's back when Shimon Perez was still alive. But when I saw this on Charisma Magazine here, Mike Evans, Pope Francis, Shimon Perez, and a couple other men, I do not know who they are, that began to trouble me. And then I began to do a little bit more digging. Menachem Begin, let me just hang on one second here. I apologize. Uh, 
So, you know, I had no really clue of what the, con that, that, that there was a connection between the Pope of Rome, Pope Francis, and that of Mike Evans, uh, or even that of Shimon Perez. And of course, I know that Mike Evans, like I said, he's done a lot of good in Israel. And he's really, he has a ministry there uh, in trying to serve the Jewish community, especially those of the Holocaust victims. So I began to do a little bit more digging on this. And of course, Menachem Begin, there's a lot I know about Menachem Begin. And in fact, Menachem Begin, as you can see picture here, to me was one of the true leaders of Israel. If there was ever a true prime minister of Israel, this was that man. Now, note, he did a lot of things that I'm sure a lot of people are not very happy with, but he served as prime minister from 1977 to 1983, the year I graduated high school and became a police officer, by the way. And he was the founder of the Likud party. He's the founder of the Likud party. He was opposed to the, uh, the Mapai party, M-A-P-A-I, if that's how you pronounce it there, which, by the way, was begun before Israel became a nation. It was the party that all of the first prime ministers of Israel were a part of. Moshe Sharit, David Ben-Gurion, Golda Meir, all of the prime ministers were part of that party. And he was very much against that party. But we have to go back, and I've been sharing some of these insights with you here recently about what happened and who Menachem Begin really was. Menachem Begin was part of the Ergon resistance group before 1948. And as you can see here, this was a, a recent article that the Times of Israel does going back on, uh, it was on an anniversary date, June 20th, 2013, an anniversary date of 60 years after the Ergon ship was shelled by the order of Ben-Gurion with the loss of 16 lives previously unpublished interviews with several interested parties underline how deeply the animosity over the affair still lingered decades later. They call it fire in the hole, blasting the Altalina. Now, I'm going to share with you a little bit a clip of the interview of Avi Lipkin when me and him, actually it's the first time we ever met, we were uh, speaking at the uh, Seret, it's a, it's a cinema inside of Israel there, we were speaking both together at the same conference there, that's where we met for the first time, and I told the story about the Bielski family, and Avi Lipkin knew it as well and shared some information with it, and he is where he spoke about this here, Daltalina, the sinking of this. Now to give you, to go back over this a little bit in case it's your first time watching our broadcast here, let me tell you a little bit about what happens here. Menachem Begin was very much loving Israel, but knowing that there was going to be an independence war in 1948, he came with a group of men from Europe to fight in order to free Israel as well to be able to have their own independence. They knew that the, the, the resolution 181 was not accepted by the Arabic community. Uh, the, the, today we call it the Palestinians and the Fatah from, from Gaza. They would not accept this resolution 181 that was signed in 1948. And we can go back to the resolution all the way back to 1920, 1921, which was giving uh, the, the, the Jewish people uh, not only all the land of modern-day Israel, but also that of modern-day Jordan. Uh, within two years, that all changed. Jordan was taken away. They were going to give everything to the west side of the, of the Israeli, uh, excuse me, the Jordan River. That was taken away as well. And then the whole, the whole landscape began to change. But there were a couple of men that were very, working very close with Pope Pius XII at the time. And of course, that was more so Moshe Sharit, which was the foreign minister of Israel at the very beginning of the, of the creation of the state of Israel, when Ben-Gurion was the actually acting prime minister at that time. Now, I want to share a little bit about that with you here. This is a book here by Frank Kappa, and I'm using actually books that are written by very devoted Catholic people, and I think it's interesting because they kind of give away the information themselves. Uh, the Life and Pontificate of Pope Pius XII. But notice what it says here. Pius XII hoped and believed that the conflict over the future of Jerusalem as well as other disputes could be resolved diplomatically on April the 10th, 1945, three years now before Israel becomes a nation. He received Moshe Sharit, who happens to be the second prime minister of Israel and the first uh, foreign minister of Israel. 
head of the Jewish agency's political department and subsequently Israel's foreign minister in private audience, Al, uh, al although there is no record of their specific conversation, some believe that an agreement and a settlement of sorts was outlined that promised that in return for Vatican support of Jewish homeland in Palestine, Catholics would be assured of a place in the new state. If such an agreement was discussed or made, it was not implemented. It was. And we do know there's more information about this uh, deal as well. Because Pope Pius XII was the one that was instrumental in the Resolution 181, which divided the land, which made Jerusalem an international city. And the Vatican would have autonomy over Jerusalem, and the West Bank would be given to the Arabic community that was mostly from Jordan. The Gaza Strip would have been much bigger. In fact, if the Palestinians at that time had settled way back then, they would have much larger area and the Jewish people would have hardly nothing to this day. Uh, and, I, and I say Jewish people quite often, and please understand me, I'm not forgetting about all of Israel when I say this. When I say the Jewish people, I'm referring not to the tribe of Judah, but to the house of Judah, which are Samaritans, the, the tribe of Judah, and the Levites that also, many of the Levites, not all of the Levites, but many of the Levites that did return back to the modern state of Israel that came from Europe. All right? But anyway, Moshe Sharit worked out that deal. And not only that, Pope Pius XII said that the land was to be called Israel. That was his agreement there. That's the one thing I do like that Pope Pius XII did. If there's anything I like that he said was naming the country Israel. But I know why he did it. Because Pope Pius XII believed that there were many Christians, and in his way of thinking it was only Catholics, that were remnants of the house of Israel and they wanted to return. And he's truthful in that respect as well because you have to understand, God says about Ephraim, he's taken away with these idols, let him alone. Because Ephraim got in bed with Esau when the Roman Empire was created and instead of carrying on the true message that Christ had given them, they got carried away with the idols. And that's where the house of Israel's trouble has always been, was idolatry. And so when it was time to redeem the house of Judah, they couldn't do it because Ephraim was carried away with the idols. All right? So anyway, Moshe Sharit makes this deal with Pope Pius XII. They're going to call the land the land of Israel. Later, it's going to be voted on. Ben-Gurion wanted to call it the Jewish state because he was only from Judah. He didn't want it to be called anything else. All right? But that all ends up changing. Now, here's what gets really interesting. As we mentioned here, Menachem Begin was part of the Irgun, the Irgun group that was going to fight for the independence of, this, of the country of Israel. He did not care what Pope Pius XII had to say. He believed that Jerusalem must be a part of the state of Israel because from the biblical side of it, he knew that we were driven from our land and that we should go back, and that was the capital of Israel. The Pope of Rome wanted to make sure it went to the Catholic Church only. And so he had Ben-Gurion, Moshe Sharit, and many of the others that were loyal to him there from the Mapai party. They were loyal to the Vatican's demands, and they said they would not allow anyone to touch Jerusalem. Now, so as that happens, then we come to the story of Tovia Bielski. And as we, this movie here, here it's on Amazon.com now, and I'm fixing to do another very in-depth story about this story as well. The Daniel Craig played the heroine of Tovia Bielski, uh, the Bielski family that rescued 1,200 Jews during the Holocaust, him and his brothers, Zeus and Asoyal. Uh, this played by Ev Schreiber, and I forget this young man's name here, but they play the characters in the movie Defiance there. Uh, in fact, my second book I wrote, Yam Suf, is about, partially about what happened in this true life event here. And I'll go into that in a very in-depth uh, interview tomorrow, uh, Lord willing. But at any way, I knew the Bielski family personally. Mickey Bielski, we call him Mickey Michael is his actual name, the oldest son of Tovia Bielski there, has sat down with me many times and shared with me personal details about his family and what happened to his father during the war, etc. When his father came to Israel, though, he shared with me how that 
This was at the time of the independence. It was before the, the, the 1948. Mickey had been born there in Israel himself. He was a small child. But they approached him, Ben-Gurion's group that is, had approached him to secure the road that goes to Jerusalem and not allow any Jews to go up that road. And if they did, he was to kill them. And Mickey said to me, he said his father told him, there is no way. I spent my life, the last six years of my life, rescuing Jewish people. And I defended them with my whole life. Everything that I had, me and my brothers. Do you think for a moment I am going to start killing Jews now? He said, I'll be no part of it. I used to think that no one else knew the story until I met Avi Lipkin. And Avi Lipkin, I just finished speaking here near uh, Mount Zion there in Israel. And he came back in behind after I'd spoke. Avi spoke after me. And this is what he had to say about that exact same story. Listen to this. Um, worry about the Bielski family. Uh, basically, uh, forgive me for trying to add some more information to what you were saying. Uh, this country, and I talk about this in my book, The Bible Block. This country was controlled from day one by communists and socialists. These were the people who sank a ship called the Alta Lena. How many people heard of the Alta Lena? Alta Lena was a gun-running ship of the Irgun, which was right-wing and nationalist. And the orders to kill, they were telling Bielski to kill the Irgun people, which is Menachem Begin's group. And that was run by Ben-Gurion and, and, and Rabin. Rabin was the one who gave the orders to kill the, the Jewish sailors on board the Alta Lena in April of 1948. With the weapons that were on that ship that was sunk, we could have taken Jerusalem. We sacrificed Jerusalem in 1948 in order to sink a Jewish ship because they were from the wrong political side. I was fired from the prime minister's office under Yitzhak Shamir, who was a right-wing Likud prime minister, by a socialist uh, administration. Thanks to the socialist administration, I have been in the Christian churches preaching for the last 26 years. Now, what Avi is saying here is very important, and this is one of the things that helped me to really uncover the depth of what's going on. He talks about Yitzhak Shamir, who was the prime minister after uh, Menachem Begin was prime minister. And he also was a Likud party member. As I said, it was Menachem Begin that began the Likud party, as he calls it, the right-wing nationalists. But there were what? Socialists in his administration. That's very important. Who were the socialists? Who were the ones that actually caused him to get fired? The socialists, by the way, are part of the Mapai party, and they were the ones that were actually part of Ben-Gurion and all the others that came along afterwards. They were part of that group there. Now, I want to share with you some very interesting things here as we go into this. Again, and I put this up here, so I'm going to read this, what I put up here. The Bridge Builder from the Jerusalem Post. Uh, this was June 14th, 2012. It says, over 30 years ago, Dr. Mike Evans, a devout American Christian Zionist leader, uh, multiple New York Times best-selling author and renowned Middle East expert struck an unlikely yet powerful and enduring friendship with then Prime Minister Menachem Begin. The friendship transformed the relationship between evangelical Christians and the state of Israel forever. He asked me why I came to Israel. Evans says of the first meeting with Begin in 1979, it, at first I could answer him. A couple of days later, I knew the answer. Now, the reason I put this up here, though, is for the date. 1979, when he met with Prime Minister Menachem Begin. What was going on? As I'm looking at this now, I realize when Menachem Begin became Prime Minister, he broke a tradition that was happening in Israel where the Mapai Party had been in power from the very inception of Israel from 1948 until... 19, was it 1977, I believe it is, that Menachem Begin became prime minister. And for the first time, a right-wing nationalist gained control of Israel, a man that would not work with the Vatican. 
A man that in 1948 was part of the Ergon uh, uh, revolution that although they had agreed to work with the IDF, refused to let, uh, let Jerusalem be sacrificed and go to the Vatican. Now some might think the Arabs, no. According to the Resolution 181, it was to go to Rome. Look up the maps, you'll see it for yourself. And so when Menachem Begin came into power, immediately they were looking for a way to undermine the power of the Likud party. Now, we know today that Prime Minister Netanyahu is a Likud member. But watch what happens. Now, as Avi says, he was fired by the socialists that were in Yitzhak Shamir's administration. He was, at that time, before he became Prime Minister, he was the Foreign Minister of, of course, Prime Minister Menachem Begin. But watch what happens. I found this article here, and it's very interesting, called The Hidden Pope, The Untold Story, A Lifelong Friendship That Changed the Relationship Between Catholics and Jews. He's right. Oh, Darcy O'Brien is, uh, is the author of this book. Listen to what it says here, and think about it for a moment. What a coincidence, or is it a coincidence, that in 79, Mike Evans, an evangelical, comes to Menachem Begin, the Prime Minister of Israel, and begins to cause an undermining of the Likud party. Watch here. Foreign Minister Shamir had every reason to distrust John Paul II, as a Pol Polish-born Shamir had acute family reasons to be, very, to be wary. All right, now this is now, it's no longer Begin, this was Begin's foreign minister, Yitzhak Shamir, who becomes the prime minister. And, there, and this author here is writing about how the Pope is going to capitalize on some events here to gain his trust. But in my opinion, that trust was being gained already when Mike Evans comes in there and begins to talk about building bridges. Watch what happens. And keep in mind, the picture I just shared with you with Mike, with the Pope, and Shimon Perez. Watch what happens. He had an acute family reasons to be, to, to be wary. During World War II, Shamir's father, having escaped from the Germans in Poland, had been murdered by Polish-Ukrainian peasants. Jurek briefed the Pope about the, de the, the degree of suspicion that His Holiness would likely encounter. Five days before his visit to Rome, whoever on January the 4th, 1982, excuse me, however, on January 4th, 1982, the foreign minister developed, uh, delivered to the Knesset, the Israeli parliament, a remarkable speech that was obviously intended as a conciliatorial message to the Pope. In it, Shamir, who was second only to Menachem Begin in power, would succeed him as prime minister only two years later. I apologize, I forgot. He was still, he was still at that time the foreign minister for uh, Menachem Begin. My apology. I get my dates mixed up sometimes. Uh, anyway, he succeeded him as the prime minister only two years later. Called Israelis' attention to the political unrest uh, in Poland, calling it a crack in the totalitarian iceberg and an authentic mass movement, he was referring to the solidarity, the rebellious Polish labor movement. Now keep in mind, he's the foreign minister under Menachem Begin, and just three years before that, Mike Evans comes to Menachem Begin and talks about wanting to build bridges. Anoints Netanyahu prophesies over him that he's going to be prime minister twice, not once. All right, so this happens. Now, two years later, they're trying to get a meeting between Pope John Paul II and the foreign minister of Israel. Why? Because all the prime ministers before then had no problems with the popes. Everything was going great. 1967 war comes along. In 1967 war, the Israel wins. They take, they take Jerusalem. That upset the Vatican, upset the whole status quo of what they've been working on. And there had been no big, there was no push by the Vatican at that point either. Because they felt like they had control. They were controlling all the prime ministers up until then. 
Menachem Begin comes in, though, they already know they got a problem now because he was absolutely would not heed to the Vatican's demand to relinquish Jerusalem. So they knew he wasn't the man. So they had to begin to find a way to undermine the administration, especially if they see that Yitzhak Shamir would become prime minister next, which he does. So watch what happens. Which he termed marvelous. Shamir went on to pray solidarity as a miracle and to ask Israelis to understand that their cause was Poland's also. He drew parallels between Poland's struggle for freedom suppressed anew by the Soviet Union and Israel's. He called upon the democratic nations of the world to come to Poland's aid. All right. He called upon democratic nations of the world to come to Poland's aid. He asked that a conference be convened and that at first an item of business be mobilized to the entire democratic world on behalf of Poland's struggle for freedom. The speech wasn't widely noticed at the time except by John Paul. Notice that. It is a singular document coming as it did from a Polish-born Jewish statesman, Shamir, did address the fact that the millions of Jews were slaughtered and that country by Germans and the active assistance of very many members of the Polish nation. Our account with the Polish nation is long and bitter, but it is not this account. He added, which today draws our attention what is transpiring in Poland. It was democracy, Shamir said. That mattered now, not past grievances. Now keep in mind, he said that many of the nation's leaders were involved with the Germans. You notice how that law just came out recently? You're not allowed to say anything against the Poles anymore. You can't call it Polish death camps. You don't think Rome doesn't have a hand in that? Sure they do. And now Shamir was in Rome to see the Pope. And Jarek later learned John Paul greeted the foreign minister by placing both hands on his head, a traditional rabbinical blessing, and wishing him shalom, naturally, in Polish. Now, the Pope then knew what to do to win over the Jewish people. And that's what people don't know. That's what they don't realize. Here's what's interesting. Now, let's go back, though. Let's look at something here. Real quick, this was in nineteen. This was January fourth, nineteen eighty-two. That Yitzhak Shamir, as foreign minister, made that powerful speech for the Polish people. Right. The Pope of Rome heard it. He made note of it. Right. Then we have the meeting with Ronald Reagan and Menachem Begin, Prime Minister Begin. Israeli Prime Minister Menachem Begin and Ronald Reagan at the White House, June 21st, 1982. Within five months, they're meeting. Is that a coincidence? No. What do we have happen next? All right. Now, let me back up. Let's look at it again. June 21st, 1982, they're meeting at the White House. But on June 7th, 1982, Reagan was already well underway carrying out the Pope's command. Remember, there was an article on Time Magazine. This is part of the article right here, but it was a big cover. I used to have the magazine, kept the whole thing. It says, Holy Alliance. Reagan felt like seeing he had been shot and the Pope had been shot. They had something in common. And of course, they wanted to collapse the Soviet Union. And the Pope knew specifically he had to be able to get Poland liberated in order to win over the Jewish people. We hear here, we read here, only President Ronald Reagan and Pope John Paul II were present in the Vatican Library on Monday, June 7th, 1982. It was the first time the two had met and they talked uh, for 50 minutes in the same wing of the Papal Apartments. Agostino Cardinal Casarelli and Archbishop Achille uh, Silverstrini met with Secretary of State Alexander Haig, who is Catholic. Judge William Clark, I believe was Catholic as well. Reagan's national security advisor, most of their discussions focus on Israel's invasion of Lebanon. Then in its second day, Haig told them Prime Minister Menachem Begin had assured him that the invasion would not go further than 25 miles inside of Lebanon. 
Watch what he says next, though. But Reagan and the Pope spent only a few minutes reviewing events in the Middle East. Instead, they remained focused on a subject much closer to their heart. It wasn't so much Reagan's. It was Menachem, or excuse me, it was Yitzhak Shamir. Remember, Avi Lipkin was fired from his office, not because of the Likud party, because of the socialists that were in there. They didn't need anybody in there that could undermine their plans to overthrow what they were planning already. The dominance of Eastern Europe in the meeting, Reagan and the Pope agreed to undertake a clandestine campaign to hasten the dissolution of the communist empire, declares Richard Allen, Reagan's first national security advisor. This was one of the great secret alliances of all time. And as we've been showing you already, it's, it was done specifically to appease the next incoming Prime Minister, Yitzhak Shamir, because they wanted to break that Likud party. They needed to break the spirit. Could Mike Evans have been a part of that? I don't know. I think it's rather odd of his timing, and I think it's rather odd, not only of his timing, but I think it's rather odd also of what happened afterwards as we see the, Pope, the picture with him, with Pope uh, Francis and Shimon Perez, who, was the, who worked diligently with the Vatican in 1993, which finally gave over a promise to the Vatican that they would indeed get Jerusalem, the old city. Now, I want to share with you something here. We're looking at the prime ministers of Israel from the beginning. David Ben-Gurion, officially 1955 to 63, he was actually the prime minister from 1948 to 1954. Moshe Sharit, which was the man that met with Pope Pius uh, the, the 12th in 1945, as I mentioned to you already. He made the secret deal with him then that they would divide the land the way they would do according to Resolution 181, which not only would, it's not just the old city, would give all of Jerusalem to the Vatican and a United Nations force would control it. That's the same thing that Shimon Perez finally brought into to being as well. David Ben-Gurion, Levi Ishkol, and Golda Meir, all four of these prime ministers the Mapai party, and were willing to keep the status quo for Rome to keep Jerusalem, according to Resolution 181. Now, then something happens. Menachem Begin, who was running the, uh, the Erdogan uh, group that wanted to take Jerusalem, becomes prime minister in 1977 to 1983, totally upset the status quo. It was after the uh, war in 1967 where, where Jerusalem was taken, uh, in which, by the way, I have to say, that was uh, under the watch of Levi Ishko, a good man. They were able to capture it. I'm sure that was another thing that really upset the, the, the pumpkin wagon, so to speak. Uh, but any, at, at any rate, though, uh, the main one that really upset the entire program was Menachem Begin. Yitzhak Shamir, he was also not one that the Vatican liked very well but they were working on him by taking and making sure Poland became liberated because they saw his speech, they saw his passion. The Pope was briefed on him, Pope John Paul II, so he knew what to do. Then the next thing is we get this strange coincidence that now they're working with Ronald Reagan to topple this. Hmm, interesting, isn't it? Yitzhak Rabin comes along. Now Yitzhak Rabin was the very man that gave the orders to sink the very ship the Menachem Begin had brought in from wealthy Jews that had brought in all the military equipment that was needed to be able to take Jerusalem during the 48 war. So Rabin comes in, he becomes the prime minister. He's later assassinated. The incredible book, Who Murdered Yitzhak Rabin, was written by Barry Chamish, which shows that Shimon Peres' hand was involved in the death of Yitzhak Rabin. Of course, Yitzhak Rabin is accredited to the Oslo Accords, and also the secret meetings that was being held by Shimon Peres at that time with the Vatican. Shimon Peres didn't want Yitzhak Rabin to have the credit, but he worked with the Vatican to be able to get the two-state solution and to also to guarantee that Jerusalem, the old city of Jerusalem, would go under the Vatican control with a United Nations force controlling all of Jerusalem. They would divide Jerusalem, by the way, and later, in that same accord, the Vatican agreed to give Yasser Arafat 
East Jerusalem, and the Jews would be given West Jerusalem as their capital. That's actually in the 1993-1994 Oslo Accords. Not the Oslo Accords, but the secret meeting between the Vatican. All right, Joel Bainerman, the late investigative journalist, he was killed because of reporting about this deal. Barry Chamish, he said to me before he died that he knew that they were still trying to kill him and he feared for his own life. His own daughter, I believe, says that she believes that he was murdered. Then we had Ehud Barak and Ariel Sharon. Ehud Barak was going back in line with what these guys here were doing. But Ariel Sharon, another one, he began to derail the process once again. Now, he did some things that wasn't that great. He did do some of the things that the Vatican wanted. He took the settlement that was down by Gaza and removed all the Jews from there. It wasn't a good thing. But it wasn't, that's not why he had a stroke. According to Barry Chalmers, Shimon Perez had had tea with him that day, and right after he left the office, suddenly Ariel Sharon falls over with a stroke, and Shimon, uh, Barry Chalmers said that he believed that he had been poisoned by Shimon Perez. And of course, Barry Chalmers also writes in detail that the gunshot wound that Yitzhak Rabin had was not the fatal gunshot wound, but if you look at the reports itself that was in the trial, he had a front chest shot wound and he was actually shot by the assassin, not from the front. And he said, who shot him when he got in the car? By the way, I believe it was Shimon Perez that rode in the car with him. So there's a lot of speculation even where that is concerned as well. Very troubling information. And then we have uh, Ehud Olamert, a special trust will take over the Temple Mount. He again, right along with the rest of the crooked bunch, he took over when Rabin was assassinated, uh, took over where uh, Rabin was leaving off uh, after his assassination. Let's see, I think we have Ehud Olamert in here. Don't we have him in here? Uh, no, oh no, I'm sorry. He, he took over after Ariel Sharon, not, not Rabin. He, when Ariel Sharon became incapacitated by the stroke, uh, Ehud Olamert uh, took his place and of course, he was all, there was all kinds of uh, scandals about him. They said he was taking briberies like the accusing Prime Minister Netanyahu today. Uh, he ends up being convicted and ends up serving 16 months in prison inside of Israel. So very troubling situation. But he was one of the first ones that says the Temple Mount is not ours. Neither the Palestinians, explains former Israeli Prime Minister Ehud Olamert. Well, if it's not the Palestinians and it's not belongs to the Jewish people, who does it belong to? A special trust, as he said, will take over the Temple Mount. A special trust? Well, Shimon Perez had worked all the details out. He knew how it was supposed to go. And then we have this right here. Prime Minister Netanyahu, in his first time when he was Prime Minister, was not for the dividing the land. Very strong. And even now, he's gone once again back to not willing to divide the land. Is this why he's coming under the allegations right now of corruption? Is he standing in the way of something that the Vatican and all these other prime ministers have worked so hard to do? He is a Likud party member as well. But again, as God prophesied in his word, is there no king in thee? Mike Evans may have anointed him to be king over Israel, but the thing is, according to the scripture, he must fail. As much as I appreciate nothing out of the things that he has done good for the country, the only way we will recognize who our Messiah is is when the king fails. And the Jewish people, unfortunately, under duress, as he says in the prophecy over there in, in Micah, why do you have your hands, or, or, or uh, you're as a woman that is in travail? Is there no king in thee? Israel is suffering because the prime minister can't pull off what they wanted. It kind of reminds me right here, and I didn't think about this until just now, but it's like when King David took Besh uh, uh, Bathsheba, Bathsheba, he took another man's wife. And God was not pleased with David for what he did. He sends the prophet Nathan to him to correct him. And Netanyahu has done the exact same thing that David did. He saw another man's wife. And in this case here, it's the wife of Balaam. It's a Zadonian once again. And he's taken Rome to be Israel's wife. God is not pleased. He will not share his glory with another. And he will not share his beloved bride with another. 
Rome is not the husband to Israel. But just like Ahab married Jezebel, and it wasn't so much Netanyahu, it was Shimon Perez that brought the idolatry back into Israel. And the king right now is making a mess of that as well. And I appreciate the fact, though, that he does not want to give up the two-state solution. He does not want to cave into it, and he's trying desperately to hold on. And I think this is why they're trying to move him out of power. This is why they're trying to dig up the dirt on him. And it's not just cigars, friends, and it's not just trying to coerce the newspaper into doing this deal or that deal, but it's also about submarine deals and contracts and everything like that that is coming out. You know? But as others have pointed out, is he doing any different than any other world leader? I don't think he is either. No, I agree, he's not. But they have targeted this man. But again, I don't appreciate that type of situation either. You know, it kind of reminds me too, I wanted to just share with you in closing here. When John Kerry, when Obama was president, John Kerry was the uh, Secretary of State for the United States, and he makes this nine-month quest for Middle East peace. As it says here in the Washington Post, it ends in failure, April 29, 2014. It didn't end in failure. You know, the very thing that they had been trying to bring about from the very, since 1948, making sure that Rome got Jerusalem and to overthrow what Menachem Begin was trying to keep them from being able to do, they begin to work. The Vatican's not stupid. They begin to work with the United States under Barack Obama and John Kerry. And they began that nine-month negotiation. I shared this back with you. Even when John Kerry was talking about the nine-month negotiation, it was the prophecy where Rachel says, she goes to God and she says, you know, that she's having this trouble. The children were fighting in her womb. And she says, Lord, why am I thus? And God says to her, there are two manners of people in your womb. There are two nations in your womb. And I'm just paraphrasing. He says, and when they come forth, there would be, or there'll be two nations when they come forth. And at that time, I said, this is not a two-state solution between the Palestinians and the Israelis. This is a two-state solution between Esau and Jacob, as the scripture says. Obadiah declares that Rome is Esau. He is the one that stood aloof as the children of Israel were taken into captivity back in 70 AD, as Obadiah declares. And when John Kerry was working out this nine-month negotiation, I knew that it was nothing to do about a two-state solution between the Palestinians and the Israelis. It was everything to do with a, with a negotiation, a settlement between Rome and Israel. The Palestinians, as Daniel records, is a small people that they came up strong with. Now, what's interesting, April 29, 2014, that's when they declared it a failed two-state solution, but the baby was born. Pope Francis holds that communion up in the upper room above King David's tomb, showing that not Netanyahu, but the Pope of Rome, the Pope of Rome wearing his crown on his head was the King of Israel. And once again, I would say to Israel, not just because of Netanyahu, but even in the case of the Pope of Rome, is there no king in thee? He's not a king. Has thy counselor perished? Your true counselor was Christ. What does it say in Isaiah 9? He is a counselor, prince of peace, the mighty God, the El Gibor. Obadiah chapter 1 says right here, For as you have drunk upon my holy mountain, so shall, you, shall all the nations drink continually. Yea, they shall drink and swallow down, and shall be as though they had not been. That's masculine plural, men only. And in that group there, that day, there were men only with the Pope of Rome doing the communion service. And continually, the heathen or the nations or the churches will continue to drink upon what? God's holy mountain, Mount Zion. Prophecy was being fulfilled. Friends, if this type of message here is what blesses you, we need your help to keep these things, to keep the truth of what's really going on, to bring it out. There's a lot of people out there trying to stop what we're doing 
every direction you can imagine. You have no idea the efforts that are being put forth behind the scenes, publicly, everything to discredit what we're saying. But we've just unraveled to you what Rome is doing. You know, I don't want to see Prime Minister Netanyahu to resign. Not like that. If, 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 they're, if they decide that something like this would have to, have to happen, do it the right way. You know, have an election, do it the right way. We don't need to jeopardize the security of Israel as a result of that. And I don't want to see either the prime minister get angry and then use war to try to stay in the office either. But the reason why it's happening is not, even if it's nothing to do with the prime minister, let's say if he's innocent of all the charges against him, and he may very well be, God has already said in his word, is there no king in thee? My friends, he will not work. I know he stands in the way of the two-state solution, and that's what I appreciate, appreciate tremendously about Prime Minister Netanyahu. Don't think that I don't love the man. I appreciate that about him. As far as Mike Evans, I don't know. I've always appreciated what the story is that Mike has told. Could that have been the beginning of the undermining, though, of the relationship? As I see these pictures, all the people here involved with Rome, that's corrupt, though, friends. I have to tell you just like it is. Even Netanyahu. But I, with Netanyahu, I expect it more with him. Because you have to understand, Rome has to be in control in Israel in order for the Messiah to return. Because when Yeshua left, it was the Romans that condemned him to death. Even the Jews did as well, but the Romans did as well. Friends, if this message is a blessing to you, stand with us. Support this ministry. IsraeliNewsLive.org is our website. You can give securely online or on our YouTube channel. There's a link right there by the, right above the subscribe button. You can click on that, support that as well. And our address appears here in the United States and in the description, our address, the website, and even uh, our European address. Uh, we still are able to get our mail there. We've been a little bit behind on checking that mail there, uh, but we'll be returning soon, so we'll be able to check it once we get there. Stand with us, won't you? And keep this type of broadcast alive that does not tickle the ears of the people. We love you, God bless you, and thank you. I'm Stephen Benoon with Israeli News Live.